it is a game that's about the missions. Each, each mission is a self-contained little world, and it, it, even if it's part of a larger narrative, and it's supposed to be, you're supposed to be able to pick up Mumbai and just play it, and the targets will always be the main characters of this franchise. I mean, they get by far the most screen time, right? <laughs> It, it, it's an uh, eternal joke here that you know, we build up these amazing deep characters and then we kill them off and then we move on to the next <laughs> one. <right? laughs> Wonderful, Mr. Rangan. Can you look up a bit? Thank you. Story may not be the first thing that comes to mind when you think about the new Hitman, but the narrative trappings of this world of assassination are of critical importance to the success of these games, and in this episode, we're going to explain why. Everything from the tapestry of targets and corporations that make up this universe, to the subtle way the story has been introduced less like a game and more like a TV series, right down to the creation of a new style of 47 and the terrific dark humor that runs through Hitman's veins. The reason you probably don't think about a lot of this stuff is that it just kind of works, and the architect of much of this is lead writer Michael Vogt. Yeah, so I think this is around 2013. We started talking about uh, not doing, a, not doing a, 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 like a hard reboot, but more, more like redefining the universe, uh, like a soft imagining we called it. So Absolution had definitely not been a classic Hitman game, so there was a general sense of uh, going back to the roots. And during that time, it seems like there was a shift in the industry where before that, most AAA games felt like B-movies uh, in a narrative sense. Uh, but something was changing, you know, the, the Last of Us had just came out and it feels like, you know, the, the bar was raised quite a bit. So me and, me and Kristen, our, our creative director, we, we thought it was important to sort of try and hit that uh, like quality drama, HBO benchmark uh, sort of thing. And, and we also had a very clear idea of, of a genre shift where we felt, you know, this should be an agent thriller. It hasn't really been an agent thriller so far, it's more, more been like a crime thriller, I guess. The initial thoughts was about, you know, Casino Royale, it was the, uh, the, the first of the Brian De Palma uh, Mission Impossible film. Some of those really dry 70s spy thrillers like Three Days of the Condor, Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy, that, that, that sort of thing. So we're definitely going in a more, more grounded, more mature, uh, also more cerebral uh, direction. The tone was going to be different as well, where the old games felt, I mean, they're, they're very different too, uh, of course, but in general they felt very cold and, and cynical. And we wanted something that was more adventurous and aspirational, so we sort of shifted it into this more, more Bond-like territory, where 47 is someone who travels the world, goes to, to glamorous places, and really only deals with the, like the elite. Um, so it became a more exclusive world, and, and, and also we developed a stronger moral compass, so it felt aspirational. I mean, normally when, when you watch an, a, a secret agent film, you don't feel like this is a murderous psychopath. You feel within the context of uh, that universe that, that, that what they do is justified. And it's, it's very hard to make assassination aspirational, of course, <laughs> um, but, but, but you can sort of twi twist it so it, it feels again, within the context of the game, that it feels justified and, 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 and you don't get a sour taste in, in, in your mouth. Um, and that's definitely uh, got to do with uh, you know, defining a very true North. In this sense, it became uh, Diana Burnwood, the handler, that she's actually uh, an idealist, a uh, bit of a vigilante, a dark justice uh, character who, who, who curates 47's missions, uh, so it's always in a, at least in a biblical sense, justifiable. The original Hitman game was developed at the turn of the last century, and since then a lot has changed in the way video game stories are written. The pulpy, larger-than-life, almost comic book persona of the original 47 probably wouldn't work in the media landscape we enjoy today. This new Hitman didn't only need a contemporary story, but a contemporary Hitman. The danger here is that you also run the risk of being overly serious, a trap that Absolution certainly fell foul of. So how do you create a character who is both as serious as a brick to the face, while capable of seriously funny moments? This was both an issue for the narrative and the game's design team. 
So first of all, we did the, um, the original sort of reveal trailer for the entire universe actually, where 47 is running in the snow. Uh, already there we had discussions about how much of a superhuman is he actually. Uh, and we ended up giving him a, well, close to su superb conditioning, if you will. He's running very fast in the snow, but he's not running like, you know, mutant-like fast. He's a human being uh, of flesh and blood. I think his super skill is that he is, uh, has this complete ability to absorb data in the world and uh, prepare so massively for things that it defies our comprehension. So that doesn't mean he's Superman, but that just means like he might be the guy who, go, who takes advanced drumming lessons before going to a, uh, a resort. And you know, you can see him there, you know, training it out and then he'll master that. Uh, albeit, as they also comment, he's very minimalistic and very tight. Um, I think that's his, his thing. He can actually, I think he can, he can master a lot of things, but that's how he actually passes as a security guard because he's, he's seen all the micro signs and micro moves that they do with their mannerisms and all that stuff. He just, it's in second nature to him. So obviously he can become Helmut Kruger, right? Since he's not really anyone himself, it's easy for him to be everyone else. First of all, I mean, he is the quintessential blank slate character. That's how he was created. And of course, it's, it's a huge challenge to, to narrative that you have a main character who defies all the principles of storytelling, basically, because it's not even that, it's not even that he's two-dimensional. Uh, you can work with that but he doesn't have goals, he doesn't have needs, he doesn't want anything but to complete uh, his mission, right? And of course, that, that's a challenge because you can't, have, you can't have a change arc, you can't have a hero's journey, it just doesn't fit. And if you try to force it, it will turn into you know, like ludonarrative dissonance. Um, so looking at characters like Dexter, for instance, and also um, uh, less known, but the character Amos on The Expanse. So these are people who are, you know, clinically psychopaths in, in the sense that they don't have empathy. But at the same time, they are aware of this and they know they have a handicap and they actually want to do the right thing, but they know they are unable to tell the difference. So they latch on to other people whom they, you know, trust in, in, in doing the right thing. In this case, it, it, it's Diana. So she sort of becomes his conscience. And, and the main character for, for, for a long while. And then we introduced this, the shadow client, uh, Lucas Gray figure. Uh, and he and 47 share the same background, but he never lost his empathy and his uh, humanity and his memory. So he's actually like shell shocked and, and has carried this awful, awful burden for, for decades. And he's very human and reacts very humanly. So he sort of become 47's emotions. So the story is actually centered around these two characters because they have all the goals and motivations and wants and needs that 47 doesn't. And then slowly you can build in change that doesn't feel forced over the course of, uh, of multiple games. Um, but that's just shoving it in there feels false. Um, so, so that, that was a big challenge, of course. The episodic release of the original Hitman 2016 was also a cause of concern for Michael. Initially, he felt like the story needed to be a light touch, as too much story would make each episode feel like a slice of an unfinished game. Instead, they opted to tell strong stories within each level, and to slowly create an overarching narrative that would develop and become more prominent over the course of three games. You can see the fruits of this patience in Hitman 2 where the story became much more front and center. But just like a serialized TV series, each episode also allowed them to tell a unique story within its setting. This process was part of the wider collaboration of each destination's track team. It's not a story-driven game. It might be a fantasy-driven game, but, but uh, it's, it's, gameplay always comes first. So it's usually like we... There are story requirements, clearly because you're at a certain point in the story, so it's like we, we, we do know who the target is or what type of situation they should be in. This is the character, this is the, this is the mindset they're in, this is the type of situation they're in, and then we'll, we'll brainstorm it from there, really. And it's just a constant back and forth for months on, on end about you know, mission stories and subplots and character loops and some of the best in-game moments would never have occurred to me if it wasn't for the back and forth with level design, for instance. A good example is um, in the Bangkok mission from, from season one. There's this moment where it wasn't planned, we just, we, we, kept, we, we separated the targets because it, it was basically easier for us. So Jordan Cross and Ken Morgan, we were never, never supposed to meet. And then very late in the game, uh, Jacob uh, Mikkelsen, the later uh, game director, was level designer, and he came and said, you know what, we just realized that some players are actually able to make them meet. 
by you know you trigger a mission story that takes Jordan Cross down into into the uh, the, the greenhouse uh, area, and then you can call, kind of like coin Ken Morgan over, and they will meet, and they and of course they do nothing because we haven't planned it, but they you know Cross wasn't expecting him to be there, and he kind of hates him, so it's really awkward that there's no uh, that there's no moment here. And I was like, seriously, how many people are gonna uh, are gonna figure this out? Is it really worth the the bother? And we, and we say, and we went with it, and we came up with this moment, which is kind of like like my favorite moment in, in uh, like a hidden opportunity where they start yelling at each other and goes up to Cross's uh, room to yell at each other some more and it escalates and it ends with Jordan uh, Cross shoving Ken Morgan out the window like he did with his girlfriend that's the reason why we're, we're there in the first place and then he calls his dad obviously like like he always does when he gets in trouble and you can you can shove him out the window and it'll look like a murder suicide pack which sounds awful when I say it out loud <laughs> dad please call me it, it happened again no <gasps> The other mandate for this project for me was to create kind of a Marvel verse in a way, set up this interconnected world of assassination as we called it. And, and it, it's actually pretty huge and it's just these interconnected uh, cross-referencing world of character who, characters that keep appearing uh, and, and corporations and CEOs and organizations and you know, people of culture, politics, all these like hundreds of characters in a way and, and how they interact and, 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 and keep crossing each other's uh, paths. So that's like a huge, I, I do have a diagram on it, I'm working on it, it looks like, I don't know, like, like a serial killer's lair or something, uh, <laughs> or like a conspiracy board with all the little... Uh, like cross yeah. strategies here. Exactly, yeah, yeah, all those companies. And of course, many of them fit into the whole Providence narrative. I think to me, um, I wrote the, uh, the final mission of season two, the, uh, the Ark Society, and it's just in terms of, uh, of theme, uh, um, it's something I'm very proud of. I, I think it's, it's a nice, uh, it, it turns very political uh, all of a sudden. It, it's, it's basically, it's, it's a secret society of the, of the, like the, the 0 0.1 percent who all know that, that uh, we are kind of screwed with climate change, but instead of trying to fix it, they are just, um, they've set, us, uh, set up this uh, research fund where they're developing various projects to escape various versions of the apocalypse. Some are more realistic than, than others, obviously, but they have a space program and they're building a nuclear powered city in the Arctic that they, they can retreat to. And it, it, it looks like a secret society. It kind of looks like eyes wide shut without the sex. The key word was, yeah, was white collar. Uh, to begin with. The problem is white color gets dull after a while because you can't, uh, can't have everyone wearing a suit, it, it get, gets old. So, so it's like 2016 was more like, uh, like a new money white color crime. People like Klaus Strandberg and Viktor Novikov and these flashy, gaudy new money types. Then for season two, uh, it was more, especially when we dealt with the, the militia, we could allow ourselves to go a little bit back into uh, like low crime, you know, terrorists and pirates and cartel bosses and, and, and stuff like that. And then eventually, you, you, you know, the, with, with Providence in the horizon and the partners, then you get to old money. Uh, so that's sort of like the three different uh, fields we're go going through. The dry, uh, minimalistic, cool, modern, uh, new money vibe, and then the, the colorful, eccentric, uh, like super criminal world, and then, then old money. Uh, all polished wood and, uh, and brass, right? <laughs> <laughs> Layering the story over the course of a number of years was a difficult task for Michael, especially in the first game where the episodes were released so spread out. But Hitman 2's collective release allowed them the opportunity to hammer in the narrative hooks a little bit easier. The final level of Hitman 2 left the series at an exciting juncture, and while players were barely noticing the story back in 2016, it's now responsible for a lot of the fan excitement in the community. Unraveling the story has been a marathon for Michael and the writing team, but he seems satisfied with how it's been received and where it's going. Yeah, they're catching on, um, we, we, which again, it, it, we, we, had, we did anticipate that. And we, we knew it. We knew every step of the way, not because we're geniuses, because it was kind of obvious. <laughs> Season one, we, we, we did know from beat to beat what, what is the reaction going to be. Like with Paris, it's going to be, oh, interesting. And then with Sapienza, it's going to be like, huh? <laughs> and, and, when, and when you get to America, it's like, fuck this. And, and then when you get to, to after Bank, I was like, ah. Oh. Season two is also much more, in, in season one, the, the, the story kind of just plays out in the background. And season two, it, it, it's like front, front and center. Uh, you, you can still treat each mission as, as its own little independent thing, but it's clearly a much more classic structured narrative. And obviously people, people are going to connect way more with that. that that's um, only natural. <laughs>